Thank you very much for the introduction and also for the invitation to this great symposium. Uh, I was invited by John to talk about uh, kind of quantum aspects of our research, but I'm also very excited about optimization in photonics uh, that uh, Sasha Boltaseva has also discussed this morning. And I actually think that it's very important to work on both if you were to build scalable quantum systems, but also scalable photonic technologies. Um, so I'll discuss both of these uh, topics in my talk. And this is a, a title that kind of summarizes both of these uh, areas of our work. So as you heard from, from Jeff, there is a lot of excitement in building quantum technologies, quantum systems. And in order to build any of these scalable quantum technologies that are useful for a variety of applications, and that includes quantum networks, quantum repeaters, quantum simulators, quantum computers, um, you need uh, basically homogeneous qubits with good optical interfaces. Um, and those could be also microwave interfaces in case of Josephson junctions, but physics is pretty much the same. And you also need efficient optical connections or microwave connections, because you don't really want to lose information uh, along the way in connections between qubits that degrades the fidelities and, and reduces the scalability of your system. So I'll talk about both of these topics, our search for homogeneous qubits with optical interfaces and also efficient optical interconnects. And you may wonder, why we're doing this because IBM and Google and others are already working on superconducting qubits and they're pretty homogeneous and, and get scalable and good. Well, uh, that's true, but uh, eventually we have to build also quantum networks. Uh, at some point we'll hit the size and scale of the systems we can, we can implement and there is a lot to gain from, from uh, using modular approaches where you are connecting them. And for that we'll have to use optical connections. So you'll have to build some sort of quantum transducers that are converting information from microwave regime to optical regime. And for that, you need these systems with efficient optical interfaces. But also at the same time, if you naturally uh, come up with a platform that already has homogeneous qubits with good optical interfaces, which is what we're trying to do, uh, that may end up also be a very scalable solution for implementing all of these technologies. So that's, that's the, the, the parameter space that we're searching for, uh, through. So regarding homogeneous qubits uh, with good optical interfaces, we're in particular working on color centers in diamond and in silicon carbide. And in diamond, we're looking into um, a silicon vacancy and tin vacancy. So these are basically two missing carbon atoms with, with an extra silicon or tin atom in between. Uh, this is the energy level structure of the system. And this is how the spectrum looks for a single of these color centers uh, at low temperature. And for us, low temperatures that we're working at are around four Kelvin or few Kelvin. Uh, so we do this work in closed cycle cryostats. We don't really need to use dilution refrigerators, but still you have to cool the system down to increase the coherence times. And the other set of systems we're studying are color centers in silicon carbide. And in particular, we're looking into 4-H polytype of silicon carbide, silicon vacancy in 4-H polytype of silicon carbide. So this is just a single missing uh, atom of uh, silicon in this particular lattice. This is how the energy level structure looks like. Here's how the spectrum looks like. You have two sets of color centers, uh, V1 and V2, and uh, the wavelength depends on which silicon atom in the lattice is missing. So what is a qubit for us? For us, qubit is basically state uh, electron spin uh, inside of single color center, and we're trying to interface it optically. So coherence time is limited by the electron spin coherence time, and photon is just an interface to the system. And if you're looking at the physics and equations of this, it's pretty much the same as Josephson junctions inside of the microwave structures. So how, where do we stand in terms of uh, silicon vacancy in diamond? Uh, so here is a one uh, slight summary of uh, the state of our research and also state of the field. Um, well, at the beginning, I said that in order to build these scalable architectures, you, you need homogeneous long-lived qubits with good optical interfaces. Uh, we have excellent photonic interfaces, and we have uh, uh, basically also long-lived qubits. Uh, electron spin coherence times in these systems are in the millisecond regime, and depending on, on some of the other color centers, they could actually be even longer than that. And that's pretty good, and it's actually comparable to superconducting qubits, but these systems are also faster. So if you divide the coherence time with the speed of operation, you can actually build even larger depths of, of quantum circuits. So we have excellent photonic interfaces. We've shown that, and also there has been a lot of work at Harvard and other places, and they've also demonstrated uh, that. Uh, we have homogeneous qubits. Um, what does that mean? When, when you look at the transitions of individual color centers, um, we see only 30, up to 30 gigahertz of spectral broadening uh, for different silicon vacancies on the chip. 
And since we're interfacing them optically, this is very important. They have to have lined up transitions or we cannot really connect them, entangle them and interfere photons coming from different color centers. So 30 gigahertz is great because we know how to compensate for all of that. And uh, how do we compensate for all of that? So we, re we recently shown that we can use uh, off resonant Raman driving to compensate for up to 100 gigahertz of spectral broadening. So what we're basically doing is where you just take laser, we drive the system uh, below resonance, we can change the tuning by up to 100 gigahertz, and then this Raman scattered photon from the system can be tuned in frequency by up to 100 gigahertz. Which means that if you have your qubits that are slightly off by up to 30 gigahertz, you can certainly interface them by driving them with different lasers. So with this, we can scale the system in principle on chip to, to any, any sizes that we would like. Uh, the, the state of the art is a two qubit interaction, uh, but that was prior to this work that we just demonstrated. So we, we think that we should, you, we and you should soon see actually scaling of these systems to, to larger dimensions. So that was on silicon vacancy, and there is a lot of activity in the field, um, also here and at other places on that particular color center. But I um, didn't really say that the best results have still been obtained at millikelvin temperatures in dilution refrigerators. And the reason for that is that the splitting between these ground states uh, for silicon vacancy is only 50 gigahertz. So at a few Kelvin temperatures of close cycle cryostat, you have a lot of decoherence in the system because phonons can mix basically spin ground states. And you don't really want that to happen. Of course, you can take the dilution refrigerator and cool the system down and increase the coherence time. So the reported coherence times that I mentioned were at millikelvin temperatures. But the reality is that it is much easier to do optical experiments in closed cycle cryostats than in dilution refrigerators, especially if you start scaling them up. So we, be, we and others have been looking for other systems that could work at slightly elevated temperatures. And for us, anything about 1.6 Kelvin is, is great. It doesn't really change the complexity, increase the complexity of experiments. Uh, so we've been looking into this group for uh, color centers. And the one that we're particularly excited about is thin vacancy color center. Uh, all of them have exactly the same geometry as silicon vacancy. They're inversion symmetric. They're immune to um, static electric fields nearby, which means that you can embed them in structures without degradations of the properties. And thin vacancy has much larger ground state splitting uh, than silicon vacancy, 850 gigahertz as opposed to 50 gigahertz, which means that in principle at few Kelvin temperatures, you should see exactly the same electron spin coherence time and everything the same as for silicon vacancy in dilution refrigerator. So we're very excited about it. And on top of that, internal quantum efficiency is projected to be much larger than for silicon vacancy. For silicon vacancy, it's between 14 to 30% which is not good. So in more than 70% of the cases, excitation events, you are losing uh, energy non-radiatively. You are not even emitting photon at the output. And again, that reduces the efficiency of the experiment, increases experimental time, reduces scalability. But for thin vacancy, it's somewhere around 80 to 90%. And we clearly see in the experiments that it's much brighter. So a lot of these numbers are just projected from density functional theory calculations. Uh, we recently did experiments that proved that indeed thin vacancy works quite well. Uh, in parallel with our work uh, was a very similar um, uh, discovery uh, done by the groups of Dirk England and MIT and also met at the tour at Cambridge. They basically saw the same, same thing and, and they, we confirmed theoretical predictions. So we at Stanford embedded thin vacancy inside of the diamond structures. Uh, we analyzed properties of a single color center. Uh, we can isolate single color center. Um, this is just the, the proof that it's indeed a single color center, single photon source, because it emits only one photon at the output. Uh, we measure line widths, energy levels, and we did magneto uh, optical spectroscopy. Uh, we studied properties of energy levels in magnetic uh, field, and everything matches theory, which is very uh, promising. We haven't measured electron spin coherence times yet, but we uh, are working on that. And we're also working on embedding it in optical structures. And if all works well, uh, I think that this is the right way to go, that this is a much better substitute uh, to silicon vacancy because you can actually do experiments at few Kelvin temperatures and, and build more scalable systems. So the other set of color centers that we've been studying are uh, silicon vacancies in silicon carbide. Um, so this is a, a in particular 4-H polytype of silicon carbide. There are many other polytypes of silicon carbide, uh, cubic, which you can grow on silicon, for example. 
uh, 6H, 4H, we like uh, 4H, um, and in particular, we like uh, silicon vacancy core center inside of this material, which is a missing silicon atom. Uh, and transitions of that system are around 900 nanometers. It has very nice energy level structures. You can control uh, electron spin properties optically. Um, and in collaboration with uh, Jörg Rachterup's group in Stuttgart, a few years back, uh, we also measured electron spin coherence time at 5 Kelvin temperature, and it's equal to 600 microseconds. So again, this is comparable to the values that, that Jeff Elzer also mentioned for superconducting systems. I'd like to mention that for these systems, if you can do uh, all optical spin control, everything is much faster because in principle with 100 picosecond pulses, you can control the state of an electron spin. So you can build larger depths of the circuits. Of course, these systems haven't been scaled uh, to the scale of superconducting systems yet, but it's important uh, to note that once we start scaling them up, they're quite competitive. So in the initial work uh, uh, with Jörg, I mean, we could only make uh, pillar type structures. Um, and this is because 4-H silicon carbide is just a block of material. Of course, you can buy it from companies such as Cree and you can get it in high purity. But to make photonics, you need some, some high index material on top of low index material. You can't grow 4-H polytype uh, in that form. You just get a block of material that you have to carve in three dimensions. A uh, 3C polytype could be grown on silicon, but doesn't really host favorable color centers. So we spent a long time uh, trying to come up with a thin film silicon carbide platform so that we could make resonators. And of course, the same thing for diamond. You know, we also had to figure out how to make structures and carve out diamond in three dimensions. And my, my uh, group members have recently come up with this beautiful way of, of making silicon carbide on insulator. Uh, for those of you doing photonics, this is completely equivalent to silicon on insulator or lithium niobate thin films on insulator. Um, but we went through several different tries of, of doing this uh, so that we don't ruin the, the electronic properties of the material and then we don't ruin quantum optical uh, <coughs> color centers inside of the material. So smart cut, for example, that's used for silicon on insulator doesn't really work that well here because it would also introduce unintentional defects that degrade your qubits. So what we're doing instead is we bond uh, silicon carbide on oxidized substrate, we thin it, uh, grind it with crystal polishing, and then do RIA thinning. And as a result, you have a thin film of silicon carbide on, on oxide, uh, and you can make photonic structures on top. And they're very pristine structures, properties of color centers are excellent. And also silicon carbide has chi 2 nonlinearity, and it's a very good material for, to also build nonlinear optical components. So how do color centers in this material look like? I mean, of course, once you have a thin film, you can make any photonics you like, and I'll show photonics to you later. But for now, uh, initial uh, set of data, we made the same type of pillar structures, but now in silicon carbide that sits on oxide, we looked at the same color centers, V1 and V2, which are silicon vacancies. And even if you're not an expert, you see that this is much cleaner and nicer than the results I showed you before. Um, before, when we just had a bulk, we would see these color centers on the tail of this broadband emission. But now, all of that broadband emission is gone. You just have nice uniform color centers, pretty, pretty small uh, spectral broadening. We can tune them on resonances with each other, and they have very narrow line widths. So we're actually very happy about this. Uh, there is no degradation as a result of, of thinning of the material. And of course, this is Electronics Material Symposium. So I, uh, I suppose a large part of the audience would be interested in all of this processing and appreciate a, a lot of processing that has to go into uh, development and discovery of new, new materials. So that's one side of the story, right? Finding uh, good qubits, long lived qubits with good optical interfaces. And of course, we've been working on that a lot. But the other side of the story is once you have qubits, you need to connect them. You need to entangle them and we're entangling them uh, using photons, um, but then you don't want to lose your photons uh, inside of the structures. And, and all of the inputs and outputs of our system are photons. And the reality of quantum optics experiments is that we and others, in general, always use very low efficiency interfaces. So if you look at the, the results that I showed you before with Diamond, uh, and likewise also in the work from Harvard, I mean, these interfaces that we use to, to couple photons in and out have only 1% efficiency. Or even in our earlier work with Dali Marsna, it's about 5% efficiency. Um, and, you know, even in commercial photonic systems, uh, basically efficiencies of some of these interfaces are on the order of 40%. They're not 100%. And that's okay if you have milliwatts of power, 
But if you have to collect single photons and, and transfer them to the next node, it's absolutely not uh, permissible to lose more than 50% of your photons or more than 90% of your photons. You can do experiments at the level of a single node or maybe two nodes. And again, the state of the art is entangling two nodes on chip or off chip in quantum network. But if you would like to go to a third node or hundreds of nodes, you can't tolerate these losses. And uh, this is the reason why we started thinking about designing photonics so that we have less loss and better functionalities. And it's been primarily driven by our you know, goal to scale quantum systems, but it has had also big impact on classical photonics, where you also want to decrease, decrease losses. Um, and the idea is really to design photonic components that have higher efficiencies and, and better number of functionalities, smaller footprints, and so on. And my group has been working on this for, for a really long time, uh, more than a decade, uh, but uh, um, about six years ago. Uh, we managed to develop uh, basically design method and, and uh, tools that would work in three dimensions, the first iteration of tools. And uh, the resulting structures are quite non-intuitive. Um, basically, uh, for wavelength splitters, and I'll show some of these later, you will end up with something like this. And the first reaction is usually people think, well, this is, this, this is going to be very difficult to fabricate. Well. Um, it turns out that we incorporate fabrication constraints and, and uh, also a robustness to errors in the environment and fabrication into the design process. So the yield of functional high efficiency structures is much, much higher here. And of course, design parameter is also efficiency. So we don't really uh, consider that we design something unless efficiency is greater than 90% or whatever we want to have in the experiment. Uh, and of course, there is a lot of activity in this area at Stanford as well in the group of, of Jonathan Fan and, and Sean Hui Fan. Um, if you're interested in uh, learning more about the field with Alejandro Rodriguez, we recently wrote a review article on inverse design in photonics. Um, and it covers uh, everything that is going on also at Stanford and, and elsewhere. And you heard also from Sasha Boltasev about uh, uh, activities at Purdue. So it's a rapidly growing field. OK, so what are we doing? Uh, so basically, every design problem in photonics could be represented as, as this. You have some black box. And, and by the way, everything we design is in three dimensions. Uh, I'm just showing you cross-cut of the structure here. So let's say you would like to design a mode converter that converts first order mode to a second order mode, right? You, you always know what your input and output are, but you don't really know what the black, spot, black box is. And these inputs and outputs are here drawn on chip but they could be free space inputs and outputs, just some modes in, in uh, whatever direction you would like. So normally in traditional photonics, people solve this problem by adiabatic mode conversion. They take a waveguide and then slowly expand it until they convert to the second order mode. But that requires hundreds of micrometers of the footprint of the chip. So we were wondering whether we could design this in a 2.5 by 1.5 micron footprint with greater than 90% efficiency. So again, the same efficiency as in traditional approaches. That's many orders of magnitude smaller than state of the art, right? So you may look into this and say, well, I'll just break this into some sort of pixels. If I'm using silicon on insulator, uh, the, uh, eventually I'll have some kind of pillars or pixels and I'll try all the possible combinations of these pixels and air. And if there is a solution, then, then one of these would act as a mode converter. Well, the problem is that even for such a small structure and pretty big uh, pixel that would cause a lot of scattering in optics, you have 10 to the power of 112 solutions, um, actually combinations, not solutions. And, and running uh, this number of electromagnetic simulations in, in three dimension um, in your lifetime is impossible. So unless you are extremely lucky, you will never actually end up with a solution that works. So that doesn't really work, but you still have to search through this enormous parameter space. And how do you do that? Well, you can apply optimization techniques, and we're basically applying a variety of gradient descent techniques to search through the parameter space. He, this movie shows the first stage of optimization, where we allow the refractive index to vary continuously. And you see you have a mode converter at the output. And then the second phase, uh, where you do binary optimization, of course, the first phase is just initialization of the second phase. And in the second phase, you end up with something that you can make. And you see that it's a mode converter. You stop when efficiency is greater than 90% in this case. And fabrication constraints are incorporated into the process. And this is a three-dimensional problem. I'm just showing a cross-cut because we generally 
constraint structure to the slab vertically because that's something that we can easily fabricate. But optimization could actually control structure also in the third dimension if, if you are skilled, more skilled in fabrication. And for the problem of this type in three dimensions and for this size of structure, um, we typically run about 400 iterations and we run this on, on gaming GPUs and it takes about an hour for, for all 400 electro, uh, steps of, of optimization and that's about a thousand of electromagnetic simulations. So again, if you're familiar with commercial electromagnetic solvers, <clears throat> this is much faster than commercial electromagnetic solvers. And this is because we also had to develop high-speed solvers in order to address these problems in an efficient way. And it turns out that it's possible to probably speed this up even further. So we did some preliminary work with Google, and it looks like uh, by, by uh, uh, combining machine learning methods with, with uh, just electromagnetic solvers, you could speed this up maybe by another factor of 10. So six minutes for a three-dimensional device of this size. So when you end up with the final result and, and publicate structures, this is a two-channel uh, uh, wavelength splitter, three-channel wavelength splitter. Resulting devices are quite robust. They, they, op, they, they perform not really nicely. These are experimental results uh, for, for these structures. And what is also interesting here is that we plot experimental results for, for multiple structures fabricated with nominally the same parameters on the chip without any post-tuning, and they all line up on top of each other. So these are not error bars. These are just experimental results plotted on top of each other for the structures fabricated by my students in nanofabrication facility right here. And if you do fabrication, you know that this is not really how it works out. You know, usually they're all over the place, and then you have to tweak some knob to tune them on resonance with each other. But, you know, here they all perform the same because we incorporate robustness to errors into the process. And uh, I said that we've been working on this for a really long time, so we developed this software suite, Stanford Photonics Inverse Design Software Spins, that several companies are, are already using uh, in, in their work. But we also recently released SPINS-B, uh, which is basic version, also three-dimensional optimization software. It's on GitHub, uh, and you can download it and use it. It also involves a uh, solver, electro and magnetic solver. Um, and uh, it's not as loaded as, as SPINS, but it's actually really useful for a for, um, big, large number of, of optimization problems. So that's optimization. Um, and Again, looking at the structures that I showed, you may say, well, you know, these structures look very uh, complicated and probably you have to do electron beam lithography forever and you cannot really scale this up. How do you use high throughput uh, fabrication techniques? Well, it turns out that you can use foundry and high throughput fabrication. And thanks to John Bowers, who is also one of the speakers today, uh, we worked with AIM Photonics. Actually, we, um, John was kind enough to give us some, some space on the, the wafers that the, the uh, AIM Photonics was making for his group. So we just sent them layouts and designs, basically GDS files that are a product of our optimization software that we would normally send to Electron Beam Writer, but we actually sent it to uh, uh, John's postdoc and he, he sent to AIM Photonics. So those are the structures that were designed according to our own fabrication constraints for our process at Stanford. We didn't really change anything. So our expectations were pretty low, right? Because Foundry, of course, does, has different fabrication constraints. But even in the first iteration, everything worked really well. And I'll show you some experimental results. So this is spatial mode splitter converter. Uh, so this structure basically splits uh, first and second order mode. And second order mode is also converted to first order mode. And the footprint is 2.8 by 2.8 microns. So we cascaded two of these and measured transmission through cascade and simulation for the cascade of two elements is here. So you expect one dB loss. That's how it was designed per single element in the 100 nanometer bandwidth, uh, two dB loss per cascade of elements. And experimentally, again, in the first run, uh, we just received the chip from AIM Photonics and we measured it. And this is what we saw, um, again, for multiple devices. So that's quite exciting. I think it's around, again, two dB as theoretically predicted. And we're now uh, continuing to work in this direction and looking into designing uh, uh, more things. And of course, this could improve if you incorporate actual even fabrication constraints that you get from the foundry. But you see that you have excellent suppression, more than 15 dB, and, and excellent bandwidth, and, and clearly high throughput fabrication works uh, in combination with, with the optimization algorithms that we developed. 
So now I'd like to show you a few examples of the problems that we, we could uh, address by using this inverse design that we hadn't been able to address before. And first few problems would be classical photonics problems, and then I'll show you quantum, uh, how this applies to quantum. So one of the problems is uh, design of uh, on-chip um, isolators. And of course, uh, isolators are one of the key components for photonic integrated systems, but in general, you know, integrating magneto-optic materials on a chip uh, leads to losses, it's complicated. Um, then uh, there have been uh, some beautiful proposals and preliminary demonstrations of dynamically modulated isolators uh, uh, by Shanghui Fan's team, but those, they occupy a lot of space and are pretty complicated. So we've been looking into this uh, broadband passive isolation, where the idea here is that you use nonlinear op um, optical properties of your structure, and silicon is also nonlinear optical material, and you design the structure in the right way, so that for the signal going forward and the signal going backward, uh, you have different amounts of coupling into the structure, and then because of the nonlinear optical properties of the system, you will have different shift of the transmission characteristics of the system for the forward and backward propagating behavior, and that's illustrated here. So at the frequency of your laser going forward, the system is designed so that you have propagation, but going backward, you don't really have propagation. And this is based on the very nice proposal by Andrea Lu uh, from uh, City University of New York. Uh, his group demonstrated this using microwave system a few years ago, but in optics, it has been quite complicated. And the reason why it's been quite complicated is because you have to design all of the elements of the system to have the right type of transmission characteristics and control the phase shift and all of that. And doing that by hand is really hard, right? But if you have optimization tools, you literally draw transmission characteristics, um, Pano characteristics here, Lorentzian with right properties here, um, that, and then you let your computer uh, software optimize the coupling region so that you have that transmission behavior. So it's been quite simple. We did this. Uh, we fabricated uh, on silicon. Uh, we looked at transmission, first continuous wave, um, and indeed we have pretty large non-reciprocal behavior range. So this is telling you that going forward versus going backward, you have uh, quite a, a large range of powers where this really acts as an isolator. Um, and it works much better than just having single nonlinear elements such as final resonator that some, some people have studied before. Uh, you have very small uh, the insertion loss of 0.15 dB, so it's a very high efficiency system as well. Well, this is really nice, but you may say, well, you know, if you have a signal on both sides, it's not going to work. Well, there, uh, it's true, it's not an ideal isolator, but there is still a large number of applications where you will work, or majority of applications, where you will not really work with continuous wave signals, but you'll work with pulses. And there, you know, in, in most uh, cases, it would just work uh, as well as an ideal isolator. And here, we collaborated with Shanghui Fans and David Miller's group to study this in pulse domain. Um, again, the same type of structure. Um, if you are working in the right range of, of powers, uh, going forward, you're just transmitting pulses, but going backward, pulses would be uh, reflected. And you see that here, right? So if your isolation is on, only pulses in the orange slots are transmitted. Uh, because uh, it works as an isolator and you're blocking pulses in the yellow slots. And then um, in, when you are not working in the right range, then basically you are not blocking the backward pulses. So it's a very simple configuration on silicon that, that uh, would work quite well uh, for blocking the backward signal. And yet another application of this system would be uh, for uh, precise distance measurements, like in a LiDAR system, uh, because you can... Uh, take the reflected backward pulses, uh, route them, measure their delay relative to the forward pulses, which is what we're doing here, and, and based on that, measure the distance to the target. And we've done that for uh, greater than uh, 30 meter distances without the need for any complicated switches, um, uh, routers on a chip. It's just a very simple element. So this is one application where uh, optimization clearly leads to a great advantage because this is not something you could have done otherwise. The other, advent the other example is just coupling between resonators and waveguides. Uh, this is the basic configuration for a lot of wavelength division multiplexing, demultiplexing in, in photonics. But in general, you cannot really design these systems to work well at multiple wavelengths. Uh, if you optimize the coupling region between resonator and waveguide, you can design it to work really well in a broadband wavelength range. So these are experimental results. 
uh, you don't degrade properties of the system. Uh, you can also design it so that it couples only one mode and doesn't couple multiple modes. So again, experimental results relative to traditional approaches where you just have an asynchronously coupled waveguide to a resonator at one point or, or pulley configuration where you put them in parallel. There, you cannot really selectively uh, uh, filter only one mode, but in our configuration, uh, inverse design configuration, you can selectively pick up only one mode. So it, it has, uh, this has great, great advantages relative to traditional designs. And on top of that, dispersion engineering, right, for nonlinear optics, for example, you typically want to have certain group velocities, certain frequency versus k-vector behavior in the system, um, people in photonic crystals community have done a lot of beautiful but brute force search uh, uh, design for the structures to achieve slow group velocity and increase light matter interaction. But no matter how good you are in terms of photonics design, you will never really be able to draw desired behavior uh, for propagation in a waveguide and really design something that hits that dispersion. Well, here, with, again, optimization methods, you can literally draw dispersion and whatever is physically possible would be optimized. And here is a design example, which again, incorporates all of the fabrication constraints and minimum feature sizes. So then uh, uh, we uh, use these methods to kind of show proof of concept that you can build dispersion engineered devices. Uh, this is the basis for a lot of nonlinear optics and on-chip frequency comps for, for precision measurements. The problem if you don't do dispersion engineering is that the distance between all of the different resonances in the resonator would not be constant, and that affects your measurement. Uh, but if you do dispersion engineering, uh, you can make the dispersion completely linear, and all of the resonances in your resonator would be completely equidistant, and these are experimental results. I mean, this is not as good as we could do, but it's much better than the traditional approaches that are shown in blue. And here is how the final resonator looks like. And the final kind of classical physics example before I wrap up by showing quantum optics examples is on-chip laser-driven particle accelerator. Uh, this is a large collaboration led by Bob Beyer here at Stanford and Peter Hommelhoff in Germany that includes quite a few groups from Stanford and also from German universities. And the idea is to replace uh, electron accelerator with something that's on-chip, uh, only four inches or several inches uh, of wafer length. And it's exactly the same as a, a traditional accelerator, except that you don't really use radio waves to accelerate electrons, you just use laser uh, light optical uh, uh, frequencies. But of course you need to couple that light, you have to couple electrons, you have to make all of your field in phase with the electrons so that they are always accelerated. Um, and there is no way you can design that by hand. In fact, you know, Bob Beyer and a, and a lot of groups ha had uh, done beautiful uh, proof of concept work of acceleration, but there were limits to how far you can go with traditional structures. So we started doing optimization for the vacuum waveguides and also for the couplers to achieve desired acceleration. And here is the actual block of silicon uh, waveguide for electrons that uh, um, actually already accelerates electrons in the first stage. And, and here are the experimental results. So when you turn the laser on, you see acceleration and the acceleration is on the order of 1.2 uh, kilo electron volts uh, per 30 microns of the chip length. Uh, so you couple 83 kilo electron volts electrons and you accelerate them by, by 1.2 kilo electron volts, which is uh, quite uh, uh, remarkable for only 30 microns of the length of, of the stage. And of course the full accelerator will not really be only 30 microns, it would be several inches. So you can actually stack up a lot of other, other pieces after this one. So let me finish by kind of telling you how this whole thing couples to quantum optics and quantum systems where, where I advertise that you know optimizing everything so that it's very efficient is even more crucial than in classical systems. So we started applying all of these optimization methods to diamonds and silicon carbides so that we could simply scale the systems up. Uh, and uh, uh, in diamond, here is the first example. You remember couplers that have only 1% efficiency that we used in our experiments and others used in experiments. If you keep footprint the same but optimize the coupler for the, the vertical coupling of the laser beam, you can right away uh, improve this by a factor of about 25. Um, and theoretical limit is 50%, but here we constrain fabrication to minimum feature sizes of 100 nanometers or so. Uh, and this, you know, you can make it also that it's robust to errors, all of them perform the same, and you right away improve your counts by, by a large number. So how does that impact your experiments? 
well, if you're measuring uh, transmission through your, uh, your uh, kind of single kind of qubit system, which is your color center inside of a resonator, you have 500 fold enhancement in counts and much better signal to noise. So if you're using these old-fashioned couplers with very low efficiency, you integrate for 10 seconds, you barely see a signal. This is what you're starting to interpret as your resonator. If you integrate for one second with optimized couplers, you clearly see a signal much better. So you can really reduce experimental time by a factor of 500. You can start thinking about connecting with, with additional nodes. And just for those of you who are not familiar with the state of the field, the state of the art in quantum networks is connecting two nodes of a quantum network in Delft. That experiment took about a week to collect enough counts to claim that you have two nitrogen vacancy centers entangled over two miles distance. Um, so that's clearly not something that you could extend to third node, but if you reduce experimental time by a factor of 500, you can start thinking about building scalable systems. And of course, you know, it's not just a single node. Uh, we're already thinking uh, and, and building systems that have multiple stages where you couple light split it, you are using this structure to entangle two nodes and then you are out coupling at the other end. And we're also showing that we have a flexibility to tune each element onto resonance in each other, uh, as I was saying before. So it's not just qubits, tuning qubits, it's also tuning photonics and making sure that, that efficiencies are large enough that you, that you can scale the systems up. And in silicon carbide, uh, you know, the same story. Uh, we use optimized elements for coupling light. I mean, these non-intuitive structures are couplers. Uh, these are resonators. We see very high quality factors of resonators, uh, which are larger than any quality factors ever demonstrated. So this is where materials developments have played a big role um, uh, in terms of developments in silicon carbide because even for classical photonics or nonlinear optics, these are the best photonic structures in silicon carbide ever demonstrated. But of course, for us, it's even more critical. And then uh, we can make a variety of structures. Again, this is the same silicon carbide material, different types of resonators that are more suitable for some of the other applications. And, and on top of that, we can also couple color centers to the structures and see that we have excellent photonic interface. So this is similar to some results for diamond that I showed at the beginning. Um, it's not important uh, uh, to, to read all the, the numbers carefully unless you are an expert. For, if you're an expert, then this is important for you that you have hundredfold enhancement in counts. Uh, you have large spontaneous emission rate enhancement uh, in the system, and we've been able to isolate single color centers without degrading their properties. And we, we're pretty sure, um, you know, we know how to align all the color centers to each other, so we're pretty sure that we'll, we'll uh, see much more, much uh, further scaling uh, in the near future. So where are we going with this? Um, well, one thing that we're clearly very interested in is building scalable systems, such as the ones that, uh, you know, IBM and Google and others are doing, but instead of using Josephson junctions, using color centers inside of the photonics, in your, your qubits are electron spins inside of these color centers, but they are optical interface. And this is how possibly that such an architecture would look like. Um, we will not have a perfect yield of color centers, but that's fine. Uh, we will characterize the lower layer, uh, see where the good qubits are, and then deposit silicon nitride on top of silicon carbide and use that as a reconfiguration layer to connect all of the uh, uh, color centers that we want to work with. Or the other uh, platform that we, we are uh, investigating, uh, and this is for quantum simulation, does not even require that. Um, there are some beautiful proposals that are based on coupling uh, arrays of atoms to photonic structures underneath that would permit for quantum simulations of spin-spin interactions, variety of spin-spin interaction models. And, you know, most of the quantum computing uh, applications are right now also in the range of quantum simulation. But some of these uh, systems are limited to either one-dimensional architectures, uh, because it's very hard to wire superconducting qubits in two-dimensional architectures and two-dimensional lattices, or even put optical atoms in two-dimensional arrays and, and achieve interaction beyond nearest neighbor. As opposed to all of that, when you put color centers inside of the photonic structure, you can have easily achieve interaction beyond nearest neighbor, and you can have two-dimensional lattice. And in fact, building two-dimensional lattice is as easy as building one-dimensional lattice. So we're uh, looking into these proposals and, and uh, working on their implementation. And we're, uh, looks 
based on the uh, discussions with the theories that, that we can already start doing this uh, with the current properties of the color centers that we have. We can, we can just build uh, sizable uh, lattices and, and do um, quantum simulations. So with uh, that, let me conclude the talk and um, uh, basically say that um, co a combination of optimization techniques in photonics that a that, uh, large part of the community is doing together with discoveries of new materials, um, color centers and, and other materials uh, will lead, I, I'm sure, to scalable uh, quantum uh, systems. Uh, and even if you decide to work on superconducting platform, which has been scaled more than the other platforms so far, I believe that also eventually you will have to use some of these systems as interfaces to optical networks, because just the full power of even classical computing was achieved once you network all of the components into large, you know, uh, computer networks or Internet of Things and so on. So you'll have all of these sensors and computers and other machines that you will have to network somehow. And the best, best way of networking things is through optical networks. So you have to figure out how to really map your, your microwave photons or Josephson junctions into optical photons outside, or you will be able to also for a specific number of applications, build quantum simulators or, or, or quantum sensors directly by using the platforms that we're developing. So there are a lot of synergies and there are a lot of interesting things where materials discoveries and, and photonic optimization will play a role. And I would also like to finish by, by thanking funding and also uh, thanking, of course, um, our collaborators who we acknowledged in particular people who did the work that I presented today. So this is my group and you see their name uh, during the talk. Thank you very much for your attention.